I thank the organizers for having, give, having given me the opportunity to present these historical ideas in this uh, important colloque. And as I said, I would like, before I go into substance, to give you some, idea, some preliminary, uh, to share with you some preliminary thoughts I had about preparing this talk. Uh, because as you will see uh, now, it will be quite different from the previous one. And not only because Professor Malgrange is a great mathematician, and I am not. Uh, but also because uh, the way in which uh, we prepare now talks nowadays with PowerPoint and so on. So the first thing is to find the pictures of the uh, dramatis persona that we are going to speak about. And here we have Dedekin and Frobenius. Uh, but uh, these are not the only pictures you find around. There are many others. And hence, uh, I have to think uh, before everything which one I want to pick. Because perhaps if I, to, if I want to speak about the conflicting views more precisely, then I may take these pictures, uh, which are a little bit more conflicting, or this other. But if I want to uh, stress the cooperation, possibly I take the, these two to the extent that at some point it is hard to know who is Dedekin <laughs> and who is Frobenius, as you see here. Uh, hopefully, we will not confuse them. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, uh, the first uh, doubt I had. And I thought about the word vertauschbar when thinking about these two pictures and per probably about the two persons. And this is a very appropriate word here because later on we will speak about Frobenius' article, Uber vertauschbare Matrizen. So the idea of vertauschbarung, it's uh, appropriate over here. Uh, secondly, you know, when you uh, nowadays are going to prepare a talk, sometimes you want to look a little bit in the web, because perhaps there is some student who wrote a paper on this and you can plagiarize him or something like that, and things are easier. So I looked a little bit about Dedekind, first of all, and of course if you do Google with Dedekind, you get the standard things, the Dedekind cuts, there's an ideal, domains, numbers, and so on, and I decided to take a look at what can I find about cuts? It's not precisely uh, the topic of this talk, but nevertheless. So I find that the Dedekind cut may be something very different from what you have in mind here. It was not of great help for my talk, but... Uh, <laughs> I had greater problems with Frobenius because Dedekind, I, I have written about him. I know better his work. Frobenius is more difficult for me. So I really wanted to find a little bit. And you see here, you have the algebra, theorem in differential geometry, and so on. Some of the names I have heard. I had never heard about the Frobenius substitution. So I decided to click on it. And you know, you have the, the, the little summary of what you're going to get and say, Frobenius substitution is the Frobenius most famous find. And moreover, there is, however, no evidence that Frobenius perpetrated the substitution. I said, this is important, perhaps. So let's take a look. What is this? Well, this is not about our Frobenius. This is about an ethnographer called Leo Frobenius, my namesake, which is nice. And what the, do we read here? Frobenius' most famous find was the brass head known as Olokun. He brought it for six pounds and a bottle of whiskey. Underwood, in fact, have demonstrated that the head purporting to be this one, and which is now in the Eiffel Museum, is not the original if head, but a copy made by sand casting. And then, there is no evidence, however, that Frobenius perpetrated the substitution. <laughs> so the only thing that is not clear here is if what a substitution or a permutation, depending on his being here, uh, consistent with his uh, words or not. Well, so I, I couldn't find a paper by a student, so I had to prepare it by myself. And uh, I have to be a little bit serious, more serious. The thing is that there is a lot of uh, material by historians about this topic. Let me mention some of it because I, I did read uh, part of it. Uh, I had read it in the past. I now had to reread. Of course, we have this uh, famous and important book by Tom Hawkins on the emergence of the theory of Lee Groves, which is a real masterpiece of the history of mathematics. Very demanding, very uh, hard to read, but very enlightening, very detailed as well. There is another, another book by Charles Curtis, a pioneer of representation theory, uh, somehow complements uh, uh, Tom Hawkins' books. And there are other articles 
For example, this article by Lamb, representation of finite groups 100 years, appeared in notices of the American Mathematical Society. His Conrad has uh, on the web uh, the origins of representation theory. And there is a book that forthcoming, notice that uh, there is here a question mark. This is hopefully one day this thing may be published. Uh, but uh, there is an interesting uh, interchange of letters between Dedekin and Frobenius. Part of it appears in the other books uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, but there is much more to be said about this. And uh, there are uh, uh, some other articles more recently by Frederick Breschenmacher about the controversy between Jordan and Kronecker and about the history of matrices. All of this is uh, very interesting and important historical material. Of course, I will not be speaking about all, the, all of this. I will just uh, go into one important episode in this uh, history, and then I will try to put it in a broader context of the history of algebra in the 19th century. And everywhere where, where people speak about the beginning of representation theory, there is uh, this famous milestone, which is uh, on the, uh, 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 um, appears in a letter sent by Dedekind to Frobenius on March 25 of 1896, in which he writes the following. On the whole, he says, one may well suppose that the properties of a group G regarding its subgroups will be reflected in the decomposition of its determinant theta. However, except for a trace, which indicates a connection between the number of ordinary linear factors of theta and the normal subgroups A of G, I have found nothing at all. And actually, it is quite likely that for the present, little will come out of the whole thing. So, what is this determinant of the group that uh, Dedekind is speaking about? Uh, given G, a group of order N, these are the elements, G1 to Gn, where G1 is the neutral element, we associate a variable Xi to each of the elements Gi, and we also call uh, X stack I to the, the one associated with the inverse element, and we define uh, a determinant theta, uh, as an homogeneous polynomial of degree n in n variables. And the variables are uh, uh, determined here in this uh, determinant by uh, the corresponding uh, uh, variables to the elements uh, gi i, I tag, etc. So you uh, perform this determinant. You obtain that, uh, that uh, polynomial. And Dedekind tells to Frobenius that he thinks that there is a connection between the number of ordinary linear, fa linear factors of, a of theta and the, and the normal subgroups A of G. And he says that if G is abelian, then uh, the, that polynomial can be factored exactly into, lin into N linear uh, forms over the complex numbers. So uh, exactly in this way, here we have a product of these factors over here. Uh, and here we have um, a, an element not mentioned so far. The, uh, I, it's not, you don't see it so clearly. Here should be, I oh, know, it's okay. So uh, here, you don't see the hat, but it should be uh, the, the, the factoring over all the elements of the group of characters of G, uh, which uh, was a, a concept that, as we will say a few words about it, was. Uh, uh, well known to Dedekind by, by having studied in several contexts. Now, uh, Dedekind says in the letter that this result is a theorem, which in, in this generality, as I believe, has not been announced as yet. But he also adds that if G is not an abelian group, then the determinant possesses, as far as I have checked, beside linear factors, also factors of higher degree that are irreducible in the ordinary sense. But this will be further de decomposable into linear factor if one allows us coefficients beside the ordinary numbers, also hypercomplex numbers. And he was referring here to the possibility of having factors which are non-commutative for the mu multiplication. Uh, and he added a non-proven conjecture Conjecture, if the non -abelian in the non-abelian case, the number of linear factors going this way equals the index of the commutator subgroup of G. As I said, behind these ideas of Dedekind, 
there are many uh, works, many contexts in uh, which uh, he was he he, ha he was well acknowledged and uh, uh, had been working with similar ideas or studying them. For example, Gauss' war on characters of finite abelian groups, which he used for assigning numerical properties to classes of binary quadratic forms. Uh, it had appeared in studying higher reciprocity and the Legendre symbol. Uh, also in Dirichlet application of analytical methods to number theory, and recent work on hypercomplex systems that developed following Hamilton's works on uh, quaternions. And also, Dedekind's own work on uh, number theory, I would say in the theory of uh, algebraic number fields, which appeared, as you know, in the supplements to Dirichlet von Lesungen. In all of these places, we can find ideas that are related to the to this idea that uh, Dedekind was suggesting, suggesting here to, um, uh, to uh, Frobenius. And specifically, uh, in the context of his work on the algebraic theory of numbers, or the theory of algebraic number fields, uh, if we take a K, a normal extension of the field of the rational numbers, and we take the Galois group of this uh, field, then given N linearly independent uh, elements of the field, he defined uh, Dedekind in his work the discriminant of the, of the field as the determinant that you see over here, where you have the, the, these products of the linear in, in the, the linearly independent uh, elements of the field, uh, uh, with the multiplied by the by these elements uh, of the Galois group. Now, from here, the idea. Uh, uh, was modified in the following way. If you take the, uh, these uh, elements to be the collection formed when taking an element in the field and all its conjugates given as above, then the discriminant that I defined before will turn into this uh, determinant, right? Omega times pi 1 pi 1, pi 2 pi 1, etc. And from here, he went on to uh, modify this idea into the idea of the group determinant, which is obtained when you simply ignore the element of the field. And then you get over, oh, sorry, then you get over here this determinant where you only have the members or the elements of the group. And then with a little modification, you take only uh, variables uh, x, y, j instead of the uh, numbers of the field. And, or, or of the elements, sorry, there, I don't know why I wrote numbers here, of the elements of the, uh, of the group, and therefore you get a polynomial instead of a value, and uh, with a, an additional little modification, instead of taking as the second coefficient, you take the inverse of the element uh, corresponding, uh, it's convenient because then you get on the diagonal uh, the neutral element, uh, which helps very much with the calculations and makes things easier. Dedekind also wrote to Frobenius uh, in April 1896, in case you still want to deal with the group determinant, uh, I allow myself to send you two examples that I thoroughly calculated on February 1886. And I uh, quote this in order to indicate you that Dedekind have been thinking about uh, these things uh, for a long time. And this is very typical of Dedekind, indeed, because he usually was uh, taking one idea and going on with it again and again and again. Sometimes he published, something he didn't. But he was uh, always rethinking and trying to uh, produce more, uh, uh, more elegant and, as I will say now, we, can, we could say more structural ideas about uh, the things he was think or the, the topics he was thinking about. Well, in 1896, Frobenius took the challenge posed to him by Dedekind, and this is the year where he publishes uh, important works that are considered to be the beginning of representation theory, uh, taking together or some specific uh, results uh, of the articles. And as you see here, we have the Fatausmare Matrizen, but we also have a a, a work of group of characters, and also uh, about the prime factors of the uh, determinant that uh, Dedekind has suggested to him. So in these works, the first thing uh, he did was to define the characters of the general finite groups, 
Specifically, he was defining the characters of the non-abelian groups. The characters, uh, I should say, these are functions from the group to uh, the field of complex numbers that they preserve the multiplication. And in the case of the abelian group, uh, they are uh, simpler because uh, you can write the abelian group as a product, as a direct product of cyclical groups. And then it's very easy to see that you have a finite number uh, of uh, characters uh, defined in this way. Uh, in the abelian case, it's more difficult. In the non-abelian case, it's more difficult. And part of what uh, um, Frobenius wanted to do was to, def to, to, to come forward with this uh, uh, um, definition uh, in the more general case. He proved the main theorems about them, and he applied these new concepts to solve the problem of factoring the determinant of a general group into irreducible factors. And uh, before I go on, just a few words about the relationship between these ideas and the uh, idea of a representation. If we take H to be the group algebra of G, uh, uh, formed by these kind of elements over here, uh, uh, linear combinations of elements in the uh, in uh, the group with uh, uh, coefficients in C, then we have a, a G-dimensional linear associative algebra over G. And there we can see, co we can consider the following linear transformation, TG, which is uh, simply taking the combination and multiplying each of the elements by the given element G. Now, if we represent this transformation using a matrix sigma G by taking a basis, for example, G1 minus 1, G2 minus 1, etc., then we can uh, see, without going into many details, but the, the, even the general idea that we have that for every G, or the, the, um, the mapping from G to sigma G gives us the right regular representation of G. And uh, theta is the determinant uh, written in this way, where each element or the, each uh, variable uh, is multiplied by the, uh, by the sigmas for G1, G2, up to Gn. Oop, uh, what happened here? Uh, and moreover, sorry, something uh, moved with the slide, but uh, you can see here, moreover, that if M is a non-singular N uh, times N matrix over C, such that it can be uh, that the product, this product over here, M sigma, M minus 1, yields a, a, a matrix of this form with two blocks, one R on R and the other S on S, then the, uh, the, um, the determinant here results as a product of two other determinants, each of which is of polynomial R and S. Uh, and hence, we can see also that the decomposition of regular representations into irreducible representations is equivalent to the decomposition of the group determinant into irreducible factors with corresponding degrees. So uh, the, the, the relation is quite uh, straightforward. And Frobenius formulated the problem in the following way. If we have a factoring of theta into factors in which, in this case we have here, factors going from 1 to L, each factor, uh, we call him phi lambda, appears with a multi multi multiplicity, or, or as many times as E lambda. If this is the factorization of the determinant into the uh, different re irreducible factors, uh, of the, each of which is of degree F lambda, uh, then ask uh, Frobenius, how does this factorization represent the property of the group? And remember, this was uh, the question uh, posed by, by Dedekind. Uh, and as I said, with the kind of uh, new tools and new ideas that Frobenius introduced in 1896, uh, he formulated the problem in this way, and he also uh, came up with the solutions and, uh, and uh, new problems, new ideas. But basically, he was also uh, able to, uh, to, to address two specific questions he had in mind. First of all, whether the number of linear factors here is the one that Dedekin had conjectured. And uh, secondly, whether the, uh, the various parameters that I obtain here, L, E lambda, F lambda, whether there is a clear relationship between them and G. So, as I said, he investigated in that uh, uh, 
in, the, in those three articles, the various new ideas he had, symmetric matrices, and apply them to the properties of sigma G, uh, which, as I said, is the uh, matrix representation of, the, of that uh, linear transformation. And among, and among other things, he came up with uh, the following answers. First of all, the Dedekind conjecture was correct. Secondly, L equals the number of conjugate classes of G. Third, E lambda equals F lambda, and that means that each factor in that factorization occurs as many times as its degree. And as I said, he also generalized the concept of characters and uh, some of the basic uh, results about representation of groups. Okay, now, the background of Frobenius to this kind of work was quite different to that of Dedekind, or had different elements from that of Dedekind. Because Frobenius, in the previous year, had been working on topics like the theory of linear differential operators, linear forms with inter integer coefficient. He had provided an improved proof of Silo's theorems. Uh, and he worked, especially important for this topic over here, on linear and bilinear forms, and on the theory of biquadratic forms. And this is certainly one of the reasons, or one of the circumstances, against which we have to see why he, uh, why or in which way he uh, took the challenge and developed it. But, but there is more, I think, to the difference between these, uh, uh, between the, the backgrounds of these two mathematicians, which tells us a lot about the way or the main uh, threads in the development of algebra in the 19th century. Uh, I just put again the topics that I mentioned in relation with Dedekind, so that to remind you uh, the different backgrounds. But we may, we may ask in a more uh, specific way over here whether it would be natural to expect that uh, someone like Frobenius would like to produce such an idea of representing groups via matrices and hence uh, trying via them to have a new, inform new information, additional information on groups. And I say, well, uh, seeing it uh, retrospectively, we say, well, it's, uh, it's a natural thing to do. It's uh, something very efficient, very fruitful. Why not? But one point that I want to stress here is that if we look at the opinions of, of several people working on group theory, on groups, I would say, at that time, would see that it, it was not very clear what were the kind of questions to be solved in relation with groups, and specifically not that one way of representing them or, or, or of trying to find out the properties would be the convenient one to do it. Let me uh, give you some examples, but uh, I, I, to put it in a, in a more specific way, I, actually what I am asking is what was group theory in 1896? What was algebra in general in 1896? Uh, and, and even we kind of what was group theory for Frobenius or for Dedekind? And what was algebra for Dedekind or for Frobenius? And even something to be related with the topic of this colloquium, how is all of this related with the work of Galois? Uh, <clears throat> and the point is that uh, at, this, at this time, it is far from obvious and it's far from uniform the way in which these answers or these questions were answered. For example, if we consider Cayley speaking about groups as group of permutations, he says in 1878, the general problem of finding all the groups of an order n is really identical with the apparently less general problem of finding all the groups of the same order n that can be formed with the substitution upon an n letters. Permutation groups. This, however, in any wise, shows that the best or the easiest way of treating the general problem is thus to regard it as a problem of, of substitutions. I mean, this is not the way. And it seems clear that the better course is to consider the general problem in itself and to deduce from it the theory of group of substitutions. Let's just say, we are able to represent the group in a certain way, but it doesn't mean that if we want to find out the properties of groups, we should look at it in that particular way. No, I know to do that, but I will go the other way around. Weber, in his famous book on uh, algebra, 1896, 
speaks about groups as groups of linear substitutions. The importance in algebra of linear substitutions, and in particular of the finite group that they define, concerns the fact that groups of permutations of n elements can be represented as groups of linear representations. And then in another book, Burnside, in 1897, in the theory of group of finite order, Cayley's dictum that a group is defined by means of the laws of combination of its symbols, so, so, that is the fact that Cayley is saying that a group is, uh, we, we must uh, not consider the, na the nature of the element, just look at the laws, uh, would imply that in dealing purely with the theory of group, no more concrete mode of representation should be used than is absolutely necessary. It may then be asked why in a book which professes to leave all applications aside, a considerable space is devoted to substitution groups, while other particular modes of representation, such as groups of linear transformations, are not even re referred to. My answer to this question is that while in the present state of our knowledge, many results in the pure theory are arrived at most readily by dealing with the properties of substitution groups, it would be difficult to find a result that could be most directly obtained by the consideration of groups of linear transformations. So you see people saying, you, we should do it this way, we should not do that. It's, it's not clear at all. But OK, we're in a time when many new results are being found in group theory and in other parts of what we now call together, put under the, the title of algebra. So going back to, to these questions, we see that, that the answer, historically speaking, is not straightforward. But Van der Waarden, in his famous book on history of algebra, from a history of algebra from al Khwarizmi to Eminator, he puts things more straightforward than this. And he says, modern algebra begins with Evaris Galois. With Galois, the character of algebra changed radically. Before Galois, the efforts of algebra were mainly directed towards the solution of algebraic equations. After Galois, the effect of leading algebra were mainly directed toward the structure of ring, fields, algebra, and the like. And I think that uh, if we look at the, the developments, including those that I have just mentioned on Dedekind and Frobenius, one has to take this formulation uh, in a very different way. It's not, such, it's not as straightforward as it appears here. And it's curious that one who plays an important role as a mathematician, not as a historian, is Van der Verden himself, of course, with his famous book in, uh, on modern algebra. And I think that by looking particularly at this famous uh, uh, map or light pattern appearing at the beginning of the book, uh, uh, by looking at this, we can understand better the kind of development that I am talking about that was not as straightforward as Van der Verden, the historian, says, in the sense that what we see here appears here, I would say, for the first time in this clear and crisp form, uh, in, the, in the sense that here we have all the basic structures of algebra, groups, po uh, polynomials, fields, uh, rings, etc. They appear here for the first time in this very schematic and uh, um, uh, I would say, e equalitarian way, saying that all of these structures are individual, uh, individual instances of one general idea, that is the idea of a, an algebraic structure. And simple as it may sound, what we see in the development of the uh, ideas of related to algebra is that, that, this, that this idea was not found so early as following Galois. And it was not found in 1896, so clear as it is here. And many developments had to, uh, to, to occur before we reach this clear situation. Here, notice that the, the idea is not just that they are instances of the same idea. By being so, we have to investigate them with similar tools, with similar approaches with similar questions, with similar answers. And all of this, I think that even from the few examples that I gave you about group theory in particular, not to speak about the other topics, is not something that is found yet. And it has yet to happen when we are in 1896. So between Galois, between Galois, what happened? <laughs> between Galois and Van der Verden, between the situation in which 
people start to speak, Galois start to speak about groups, and the situation in which we see algebra as being devoted to studying structures, there are many things that happen in the middle. And the, I would uh, rephrase it this way. This is me quoting myself. With, Gala, with Galois, a long and complex process started, which eventually led to a radical change in the character of algebra. The efforts of the leading algebra algebraists were increasingly directed towards the structure of ring fields, algebra, and the like. But there were other things going around. And they, some of them also remained after van der Verden. Finally, with Netter and with van der Verden's books, which helped um, promote the ideas of Netter, the idea that algebra deals with structure was consolidated, and it became very influential on subsequent developments. Oh, among, among the things that happened before that could uh, crystallize in that way, of course, there, there are important uh, uh, milestones, like Einstein's article mentioned yesterday. And it is important because for the first time, it proposed that uh, fields should be investigated in the abstract and using the same or asking similar questions uh, or questions that are similar to those that we use when investigating group theories. You will see, I will mention a couple of examples to show you that this was not so clear at the time. Interestingly, the main trigger for Steinitz uh, before uh, formulating this came from the theory of piadic numbers, piadic fields where we had fields uh, with the characteristic P. And of course, it had very little to do with the developments within algebra. It came from a, from a different direction. So we have here the abstract theory of fields. On the other hand, we have the abstract theory of rings that Netter helps formulate, partly against the example of Steinitz, and partly building on things that had come earlier to her. And as, uh, as uh, Colin uh, mentioned yesterday, she used to say, Estet alles schon by Dedekin. But I put it here with a question mark, because I think that nicht alles, uh, a lot of it, but not everything. And not everything, I am not talking so much about the technical details, which, of course, uh, people, uh, including Netter herself, had to, uh, to still to work out. But also in that basic idea that I uh, think that can be uh, uh, graphically be seen in van der Verden's uh, Leitfaden, it is interesting to see that even in a mathematician like Dedekin, this is not found in this way, and certainly not in a mathematician like Frobenius. And what I mean is, for example, that if we look at Dedekin, for example, in his lectures on Galois theory, mentioned uh, in one of the earlier talks, Yes, he took the ideas of Galois and started to develop them in a way that comes much closer to what we know nowadays. However, look at the following interesting uh, uh, difference that at least I see uh, while reading them. On the one hand, he has the groups of, of substitutions. On the other hand, he has the rational domains. So seen from our perspective, here you have one kind of algebraic structure. Here you have a different kind of algebraic structure. And now you start to see the relationship between them. But this is not really what happens in Dedekin, in his lectures. How we know them from the, uh, from the manuscripts. Rational domains is a subset of complex numbers which is closed under the four arithmetic operations. So it's, it's a specific subset of the complex numbers. Groups of substitutions. A, we study them because the properties of the groups, no, sorry, something happened here wrong. Uh, we have the rational domains, which are, which are a subset of complex numbers. And the group of substitutions, we, uh, we in this case, Dedekin, before even he starts his entire uh, discussion, he gives a very systematic and complete, from his point of view, overview of the properties of the groups. And this is not the case with the rational domains. Here he starts to work on them, and the properties are briefly discussed whenever needed. OK, you may say, well, this is just a, a difference in, uh, in the way he's uh, exposing the ideas. I think there is more, much more about this. And, they, and we can see it in the following way. The system of numbers that he's dealing with in his lectures on Galois theory, these, the systems, this is the subject matter 
of higher algebra. And this is the thing that we want to study as part of the theory. And the groups are a kind of innovative, efficient, uh, in, we know that rather abstract tools that we use for discussing the, the, the subject matter, which is the domains. So what I mean, they are not put on the same footing, they are not treated equally, and they, are, uh, they have a different role and a different essence from the point of view of uh, Dedekind. Another example where we can see this is in the theory of algebraic number fields that, as you may know, Dedekind published in a series of versions. There were four published versions. Uh, we know that, as I said uh, before, uh, regarding the other ideas, Hilbert, uh, Dedekind was always thinking about these things and changing them. And the changes have to do with the fact that, for him, the, ba the basic concept that he's using the theorem and the proofs, we're talking mainly about proofs of uh, unique factorization theorems, are su successively formulated in a way that every time he's able to uh, avoid more and more, not totally, but increasingly, the need to choose specific elements, for example, for defining what is a prime uh, ideal or for proving a certain um, uh, uniqueness theorem and so on. Um, on the other hand, he has the ideals and the modules. And again, the ideals and the modules in this work are not the subject matter. They are the tools. They are the tools with which you are going to investigate the properties of, uh, a, of a, a unique factorization and so on. So it's, it's similar to the difference I made before between the domains and the, and the uh, groups. Here you have the uh, fields and the ideals. Again, for us, seeing it from retrospective, from the point of view of Van der Velden, these are various uh, uh, algebraic structures. So again, here we have the fields and the algebraic inter. These are the system and their interrelation constitute the subject matter of higher arithmetics, and the ideals and models are the tools. And it is interesting to see how Frobenius considered uh, the, how he evaluated the work of Dedekind. In a letter to Weber in 1983, when Weber, Weber was about to write his book, he, he, said, he tells him, your announcement of a work on algebra makes me very happy. Hopefully you will follow Dedekind's way, yet avoid the highly abstract approach that, that he so eagerly pursues now. His newest edition of the Vorlesungen contains so many beautiful ideas but his permutations are too flimsy, and it is indeed unnecessary to, put, to push the abstraction so far. I am therefore satisfied that you write the algebra and not our venerable friend and master who had also once considered the plan. I think that this is very uh, indicative of the kind of different views that are going on around here. Of course, we are speaking here of a Frobenius a, a representative of the Berlin School with Kronecker and Weierstrass, but mostly under the influence of Kronecker, who are, their approach is uh, more, uh, as uh, Harold Edwards explained uh, about Galois, but he has uh, uh, written a lot about this on Kronecker, more of calculation, of choosing specific, uh, of basing the concept of a specific choice of an element, and there is a dialogue between these two kinds of ideas. And it comes very nicely also in this encounter between Dedekind and Frobenius on the creation of, uh, of a, a, a representation theory, because Dedekind has this idea, but it doesn't go so much in the, di the direction of the kind of things that he's doing. And he suggests it to Frobenius. And there it catches very nicely and very naturally with a point of view that he had been developing for what we call today algebra in general. Notice, however, that in the background that I uh, mentioned about uh, Frobenius, there is no specific, before there is no specific article about matrices. And, and this is a, 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 an interesting topic in itself because all, all the idea of matrices, again, if we look at it from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of the scheme presented in Van der Velden's book, well, it's easy, but we have matrices. It can be in linear algebra. It can be an example of a ring, etc. But at this time, 
matrices are in a, in a phase of transition. Well, usually ideas are always in transition, but uh, here we have a very clear uh, moment of transition because on the one hand, you have uh, the roots of the idea, uh, for example, in Cayley and some other British authors where it appears more as an extension of the idea of an hyper, hyper complex number. Uh, uh, you saw that uh, Dedekind, at least in the text that I cited, uh, he doesn't speak of a matrix, he speaks of a determinant. Uh, and uh, you have Frobenius himself having worked with the bilinear forms, etc., uh, having developed the idea from there. So the idea of matrices, it's, it's not, a, it's, it doesn't have a clear place in all the map of the algebraic or what we see as the algebraic ideas in retrospect and is in a, in a, really in a constant movement over there. And in this movement, well, uh, we, we can see, for example, that Emmy Netter didn't like it very much because she's developing the way of uh, Dedekind, let's say, as, uh, as expressed. And here we have a very interesting uh, um, testimony by Dubré, who, uh, here I will read in French, I hope not to be embarrassing. Le cours de Minetter n'est pas facile à suivre. J'ai un jour une difficulté à propos d'une affirmation qui ne me paraissait pas justifiée ni dans son cours ni dans son mémoire. Une démonstration s'obtenait sans peine pour un calcul de matrice, mais j'ai été devenu assez néthérien pour ne pas m'en satisfaire. À la fin de la leçon suivante, je suis allé poser la question à Minetter qui repoussa énergiquement les matrices et après, et la, les matrices et après trois secondes de réflexion me montra combien la chose était claire si l'on jonglait adroitement avec les modules. I think this is very typical and it's very, uh, it, it, it summarizes in a nice way uh, the developments I have tried to indicate precisely because Netter uh, uh, certainly was developing so many ideas of Dedekind, but but was bringing them to this new position in which they will, be, they will appear uh, uh, in a way that all these uh, ideas, groups, modules, uh, ideas, uh, uh, fields, rings, they are all citizens with equal rights in, the, in this republic uh, of uh, algebraic structures. And within this, she would rather not consider arguments coming from matrices where you multiply with specific elements. She, of course, she would prefer the chain arguments, etc., that had appeared already in the work of Dedekind, but here they, they came to, a, to, um, to fruition in the way that she uh, defined it. So that, in the end, I think that uh, uh, the, the, um, the conversation or the interchange between Dedekind and Frobenius, it's important not just because the specific contribution it made, that it triggered, that it prompted Frobenius to develop the ideas. Maybe he had reached them otherwise, but it, the fact is that this is the way it happened. So it's not important only because of that, but it's important as a way to look back at the history of algebra in the 19th century and to realize that there were many complex sometimes conflicting and sometimes cooperating views, and in a way, here you have it in a nutshell that helps us understanding it very clearly. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, the first reason is that mathematically speaking, it was a very good idea. I mean, mathematics and algebra specifically became very fruitful. People started to work and to produce many ideas and so on by looking at algebra in this way. So because, you know, if you take after Van der Verden, then you have other books like uh, Birkhoff MacLean in the United States, and uh, there are several other less influential books, but again, they, they, they brought this idea that this is what we have to do in algebra. And of course, Bourbaki later on taking this image and extending it to the whole of mathematics. Uh, and, and many people entered this and worked and produced important mathematics. At the same time, however, there were people, I mean, not everybody was working algebra in the way uh, Van der Verden did, even though well, it got very strongly, and most people were doing it. And I think that, uh, like in many other episodes in the history of mathematics, ideas at some point uh, became less interesting to new generations, and they start to try to look at different uh, ways. For example, OK, nowadays we have uh, very different trends in algebra. I'm not the person to speak about them, but it's obvious, even if we speak about comp computational uh, trends and so on, so that I think one of the interesting things, historically looking at this, that it's clear for many people working in algebra at the time and then with Bourbaki, is that there came an idea that was perhaps new in mathematics, that here we reach the end of the story. So this is how things will remain forever. You will have more results, you will have more of the same, you go on. But this basic idea, what is algebra and what you have to do in order to pursue algebraic research, this is here to stay. And I think it's nice that this is not the case. We are moving all the time. And uh, I guess that, you know, it's like a, like a pendle. It will come back in some way. But the specific situation is one that was once in history and uh, will not return exactly like that. Okay. The general one is the quotation from Eddie Whitaker. Yes. Which I met uh, when I was a little younger than I now am, from the circle in which uh, I was brought up. It steht alles schon bei Yeah, okay. And you're quoting people taking it seriously. Yes. In the circle that I was brought up in, it was clear that this was a catchphrase. One of her favorite catchphrases came out often. It was a coffee table phrase. It was a, what's nowadays called a soundbite in politics. <laughs> and it had just as much and just as little meaning as any political soundbite. <laughs> Would you like to comment yeah, on sure. that? Yeah, sure. No, I think it has more meaning than that. Uh, I. To a large extent, I agree with Colin, who took it very seriously yesterday. You know, if you look at Dedekind, uh, his work on, on algebraic number fields, and you see how it, this is an interesting thing, that you have the evidence, that you have various versions. And you see how he works out the ideas so that, you know, for example, that the most important one in this context is the chain conditions. They don't appear in the early versions. But they appear very clearly in the later ones. So you don't have perhaps all, you know, the for example, you don't have the concept of a ring in Dedekind, with, in the sense that here is a ring, here is an ideal, and if you have a chain uh, of ideals of that kind and that kind, you will get this and that. But the fact that you are going to analyze the, the unique factorization theorems by looking at the way in which ideas are contained in each other and the properties of this thing, this is quite clear in Dedekind. Not perfect, not, uh, not, not with all the details, but, but, but it's there. So, alles by Dedekind, I said, nicht alles. But many, many important things are there, and, and, and she, I think she, she meant it quite seriously. But that is the force of the sound Well, <laughs> that it convinced me to go and look for it. I, I say, no, well, I, you know, I, I'm supposed to be an historian who has to be careful about these things and not to find 
in the past things that are only in the present. But I, yeah, I think I found some of them there. Uh, yeah. I want to speak uh, <laughs> on that. Netter had all her students read all the appendices by Dedekind in every version, <laughs> from the first to the last. All the appendices in every version. She had her students read it. It's not a sound bite. <laughs> Uh, you disagree, but anyway, <laughs> that's what we are here for. Yes. I, my other question yes. was um, a rather more technical one, going back to, I think, your uh, talk about the Dedekind and 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 the Dedekind the letter of 25th of March, I think it was. Okay. 1896, um, that's the one. Uh, yes, a connection between the number of ordinary linear factors of theta and the number of normal subgroups A of G. No, and the normal subgroups, not the number. Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it doesn't say the number of normal subgroups. Ah, sorry. Subgroups. Yeah, I, I beg your pardon, it doesn't yeah. say the number. No, the number of ordinary linear factors of theta and the normal subgroups A of G? Yeah, I, well, I think this is... I mean, is If this... we would phrase it today, we would say between the number of ordinary linear factors and the structure of G. So what he is doing... Would you, what do you want to say about this group G? Basically, mm. this is being structural about G, saying the relationship between the subgroups, etc. So this is his way to saying that. I don't think that he's meaning I some see. specific property of the normal groups. Whatever you want to say about the normal groups, how many of them you have, etc., or what are the connections. I think this is the idea here. Right, so this is not a mistranslation or anything. I don't think so. No. I hope so. Okay. Well, it was trans Yeah, no, it's not a mistranslation, I think. Uh, yes, I have a question about group morphisms, because yes. we, we now tend to look at representations and characters as examples of group morphisms. But it's not entirely clear to me if they did at the time. Uh, for instance, their issue, as you showed, was one of representation. Do we want to represent the elements of a group in some other way than just letters? Uh, do, we, do we want to have matrices to represent uh, the elements of the groups and work uh, with these matrices? So is their problem just one of more concrete representation, or do they construe things as having something to do with group morphism, because group morphisms were seen in a quite different way, in yes. terms of usually uh, generators and relations, and you add relations, and you have uh, an isomorphism meriedric. So the, I the idea that when you have a group, you also have group morphisms that come along, which yeah. is now so um, commonplace for us, yeah. was not commonplace at the time. No, yes, I mean, you are right about morphism, and this is one of those ideas that, uh, that finally, in Van der Werden's book, become very clear, that, that you are looking for isomorphisms everywhere, or uh, homomorphisms uh, with a kernel or whatever. This is the kind of thing that I say, you move from one place to another, even though it started in a specific context. And uh, I don't remember exactly where these things, I mean, the idea, it's, it's in some of the quotations here by Cayley and so on. You now have the idea that things that may look different are basically one and the same group. Uh, so this is the idea of isomorphism, but it's not so clearly defined as, as would be later, precisely because you have one in each. I think that in the case of representations, this is not the case. The case is more than trying to translate into something which is not the same thing. Well, it's strongly connected, whatever, but, you know, in a, in a place where it's easier to, uh, to, uh, to find some properties, etc. which, well, it's, a, it's an old strategy in mathematics, like you do it with geometry and algebra since uh, uh, Descartes, and you, you try to do it in, in other places. Now, because both things, one is a group and the other thing is a matrix, and we now uh, see it as part of the same thing, then you could tend to see it more as an isomorphism. But basically, no, it's moving from one domain to another. Both of them, by the way, not very clear, because it's not yet very clear what is the theory of group, and it's not yet very clear what is a matrix or linear transformations or whatever. But, but you have the idea, or they have the idea, that perhaps here it will be easier to find some of the properties. 
I, I would like to uh, point out, first point out the truism, which will be one to you, but still it's <laughs> worth saying, and then ask a question. The truism is that uh, when you look at um, uh, Dedekin, uh, Konecker, and I suppose, and to some extent Weber, although I haven't read the whole algebra, uh, they do, don't pursue the algebraic properties to the end. But the reason is simple, they didn't care. Uh, their purpose uh, <laughs> so, was the queen of uh, yes. uh, mathematics, theory. namely number theory. Right. And they developed the means, they know what a module is, they know what an ideal is, of course, but uh, that's not an object for itself. They just do uh, only what is needed to prove the higher number theory. Sorry, and the change ca comes when the tools become the object of study. So that's the yeah, it was always, but the, I mean, it's not uh, one zero situation, but it's a, a, a focus. The focus moved to the tools. That's right. So that's the truism, yes. but it's very important when you read them. The second thing is, um, uh, despite the uh, adventurer and the Ife head, or, <laughs> there is a Frobenius substitution. Okay. <laughs> so can you say a few words about this? No, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I. The, I have no idea. I found under Frovenius substitution the, the one with the heads. <laughs> Leo, uh, from the, the genealogy you described, there, there was first the group determinant, then its linear factors from which came the characters, and only later the representations and the connection with matrices. In this, yes. Do, yes. You, do you think that the fact that Frobenius found matrices useful for this purpose was one of the things that sort of authenticated them to the mathematical community? Because it seems that before this, they were some curious objects. They is the matrices? The, ma the matrices. It's, I, I guess that it certainly helped. But, uh, but the history of matrices, I mean, I was not very aware of this, I must say. I, I read it. I read more and more in the articles by Frederick Preschenmacher. And, and also it appears in a way also in Tom Hawkins, but in Tom Hawkins is so densely packed with elite groups, et cetera, that it's, it's hard to see. And, the, and what I want to say is that this is, if you compare the history of matrices with the history of groups or, or ideals or whatever, you have something much more confusing and more, because the roots come from all around the place, from analysis, differential equations, bilinear forms, hyper-complex numbers, and so on. So that uh, it may, even though I, I would think again, because one should see how long did it take for representations to become a more canonical object, a, a more canonical uh, uh, discipline, let's say, right? If, if, because it's not so easy. I mean, Frobenius comes up with the articles I mentioned here, you have to wait a little bit, then can the other people like Burnside and Brower and so on. And there are some gaps in between. So it helps, but uh, I don't know how quickly and, and how strongly. I, I'm, I don't know the story so closely, so I, I cannot tell you. So my question, well, one question is, is there any qualitative difference between Fabianius's <laughs> kind of complaint to Weber and any of the other complaints that we always exist about some mathematics being too abstract. Yeah. I mean, now it's easy to find complaints about higher category theory, yeah. complaints about growth index, there were complaints about higher charter, yeah. about Bobaki. So there always seem to have been complaints about algebra. About uh, the, the yeah, abstract, the people going too abstract. Yeah, yeah I think it's, uh, I think you can find it even earlier than that. I mean, two things. One is that the, the abstract of today is the concrete of tomorrow. And here we have an, ex an excellent example of that because uh, groups becomes the concrete in category theory or uh, any of the, of the and, uh, and and it simply I think it it uh, it shows that uh, at any given point in time people are thinking differently uh, and we sometimes when we specifically when we see something that cut, cut so strongly as Van der Verden we may tend to dismiss all of that as people who uh, they, they they were wrong, simply. Were they, not, they were not simply wrong. They had a different idea, a different take on that. And for certain reasons, it, uh, that in, in some cases we can explain historically, one of the views became stronger than the other. But I think you have 
you, you yourself mentioned it. You have these kind of tensions all around. There, in that sense, this is not specific uh, to, to uh, Frobenius and, and, uh, and Dedekin. What I think is interesting, that Dedekin at the time, he was quite isolated in his views. I mean, people didn't like very much to read Dedekin. Even his friends, even people who thought, even Frobenius who thought our venerated man, I think he, he means it. But will he start to read all these, uh, you know, nuancings about the ideas? Probably not always. So the interesting thing is how this thing that was a tiny minority became the majority view. It has to do a lot with Hilbert, with Netter, and things like that, the, the getting and trend and so on. I would, um, I would like to ask you about a different direction that abstract algebra developed, because you've been talking about the growth of abstract notions in algebra based on very concrete issues of solving equations and yeah. doing permutations and so forth. But there is also in the 19th century a direct, um, a, a direct uh, connection between abstract ideas and modern algebra, which is of course uh, George Boole's laws of thought and modern logic. The, um, the structures of modern logic as developed by Boole and other people after that is not based on anything sort of concrete in terms of solving equations, but yeah. based on, as he himself said, the laws of thought. Could you comment yeah. on the way that this direction yeah. uh, fed into the yeah. development of modern algebra? Yeah, well, this is, we can perhaps subsum it under the title of algebra of logic, which starts with Bull, and you have Grassmann and many other people, Schroeder. It influenced it, but I think that it influenced it less than one might think. In the following sense, if we uh, try to understand modern algebra only by looking at the fact that some of the, uh, of the concepts were defined abstractly, like Cayley with groups and so on, then if that was all what was the development of uh, modern algebra, then all what happened in that direction would be highly important because then you say, well, basically mathematics is just about abstractly defined things. But what I am trying to show, among other things here, is that this is not enough. You need something else. And the something else is the identification of several ideas that were formerly seen as separate to see them as being actually one thing. One thing that is not defined it's not the case like in mathematics, you define group formally, and then you see it's the same, this and this and this is the same. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a formal concept, which like in Bourbaki appeared structure. This is not the case. I'm talking about the, a general idea that says all of this is the same. And actually what happened with the ideas you mentioned, they were added later on. Like saying, well, you have here Boolean algebras. I don't know. This is another instance of an algebraic structure. So logic is nothing but algebra. But it came relatively later. You don't find it in, in Van der Verden. You find it in other books that came out later on. I have a few remarks which uh, sort of support your thesis. Yes. Um, the first is you mentioned Lum and his, his history. Yeah. But he also has a nice little note on Frobenius. Uh -huh. and. Uh, he characterizes him as a very forceful character. Yes. And I'm sure he was. Yes. And uh, you also mentioned the sort of slight difference between Göttingen and Berlin. Yes. yes. I think that played an important role. Yes. It yes. Only, does not only go back to Kronika, but who was the successor to Frobenius? Yes. He was sure. Yes. And I don't sure. think Schur built great theories, but he did prove theorems. Yes. And um, somehow, this was a serious controversy between these two universities. Also, financial support from yes, the government absolutely. was entailed, right? But it was also a game. It's a bit like the boat race between Oxford and uh, you know, Cambridge. Yes. <laughs> I mean, they, they are real fierce competitors, but it's also fun. That I completely agree, although one must say that there were periods. And, and in this sense, if, uh, Frobenius is taken not to represent the golden age 
of uh, Berlin in the sense that there were few students, etc. And he seems to have been a difficult person. Actually, when reading his biography, I learned a new word in English that I, in English that I didn't know, crantacaros, because he's described as crantacaros in more than one place. <laughs> so now, now that I read that biography, I know what the word is, and probably he was not a nice person. But the others were not so nice either, the one would say, <laughs> except Netter. Right? I, like <clears throat> I would like to ask a question. Where is it? <laughs> um, oh, sorry whose answer is um, certainly well known to the experts, but I'm just a humble working mathematician. So on your, um, in your lecture, you uh, mainly concentrated on the German school of algebra, but weren't these results in the representation theory uh, also many of these uh, independently discovered by Burnside? Yeah, I, th I thought you were going to ask about France. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not French. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I specifically said the story is, uh, uh, fortunately, I was asked to speak about Dedekind and Frobenius so that I can focus on that. But uh, there are, I, I cannot tell you exactly if the word simultaneous is uh, very precise, not in terms of uh, time and not in terms of independency. Or the, uh, the, the, I, I can refer you to one of the books uh, by Curtis or, or by... It happens at the same time, and then you may ask, well, what happened there? He didn't have his dedekin to, to suggest. Well, of course, I mean, there is no big surprise in any of the things that I presented here. It's working out ideas. I think the big surprise is the ability to put together things that came from different uh, sides of the, of the map. And, uh, and perhaps if I, look, I looked closely at Burnside, which I didn't, I could tell you what, what threads he was putting together over there. Yes. May I say the answer is no. Ah, okay. No, Burnside got his uh, representation, his character theory, from Prometheus. Ah, okay. But they didn't really accept that this was going to do a lot in group theory until Burnside first proved yeah. the group theory theorem using character. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I, by the way, this is another important thing that all of these things are proved, are, or the, the use of them appears when they are used for some useful proof. Yeah. Otherwise, and, and, and with structural algebra, it happened because it helped solve many problems to formulate more clearly a, a uniqueness theorems and so on. Otherwise, it's, uh, it, it wouldn't have taken the way to. Yeah,